Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to present to you the work I've been doing during my PhD on simulation and optimization of complex phenomena in multiphase flows. So I will first start by some considerations on numerical simulations of such flows. Uh, we know that the study of freeze flow is a everlasting human endeavor uh, to get a further understanding of uh, processes as well as natural phenomena. Uh, in continuum mechanics, these systems are modeled by partial differential equations where the variables are both uh, space and time dependent. So the multiphase flows are in particular a subset of the fluid flows where we have two phases that are separated by an interface and to the highly complex nature of those phenomena practically unsolvable, unsolvable by analytical techniques and this is a numerical analysis to them. So during the course of uh, this PhD we had two different One we have phases, uh, typically a liquid and a solid phase, either uh, are melting or solidifying. Uh, on the left here you can see a photography of an ice crystal growing in an undercooled liquid bath where you can see the symmetry uh, branches here growing due to the anisotropic effects. And on the right, you can see the corresponding numerical simulations that we are able to do uh, for the same physical setup. So the questions we want to address here are, can we uh, first accurately simulate those phase change phenomenon uh, involving complex interfacial shapes? And the second one is, can we control the motion of the interface or at least the final shape of the interface by deriving an optimization procedure? Now, the second problem we investigating during this PhD was the dynamic contact line problems. So a contact line is uh, the intersection point between a solid, a liquid, and a gas phase. And here on the bottom left, you can see an example of a curtain coating setup where a liquid is falling onto a plane that is moving to, uh, with the velocity u and will start to put the surface. And on the right, again, you can see the corresponding numerical simulation. Of course, the trained eye will, uh, of course, notice the oak tree uh, representation here for the space decretization that is available in Basilisk. So this is very useful because when you solve these kind of problems, you want to resolve the smallest length scale, which is of the order of hundreds of nanometers, and uh, it's very costly uh, computationally wise. So the questions we address here were, uh, can we find a good mathematical model for dynamic contact line? And given this supposedly good mathematical model, can we make computations with, with finite computer power? So now if we recast these four questions here, this is uh, basically what guided uh, the, my work during this PhD. And uh, for this talk, I'm only gonna focus on the first one, which is heat and mass transfer problems. And of course, I'm open for questions for on the second part. So I will first start by uh, showing the outline, outline of the talk. Uh, we will first introduce the two-phase Stefan problem, which is the phase change problem that we will be solving. Then we will end the numerical method for uh, this specific problem. Uh, after and shows uh, melting and After the third uh, part, we will uh, discuss the optimization we uh, built to solve uh, a minimization problem based on the shape of the interface. And then we will talk about the fluid flow extension, the simulation of Rayleigh Bernard convection cells with the melting boundary. And I will finish with some uh, summary and some pers perspective. So let me start first with the Stefan problem. So this problem is a transport phenomenon that uh, uh, occurs between a, log, a liquid and a solid phase due to evaporation or chemical reaction. It is named after Joseph Stefan, an Austrian uh, researcher. Uh, and his, in his study, he particularly uh, focused on the uh, creation of uh, sea ice uh, in the Arctic Sea. So this is why I put here a movie uh, of the uh, surface, minimal surface of uh, ice sea as a function of time. And we can, we can see that it's decreasing at an alarming rate since 1975. And here on the bottom right, I also put a nice image of a glacier that uh, is um, at the tip of the South American continent and that might disappear in the 10 or 20 years to come. So it's a good time to go. Now, there's also some industrial applications uh, to this problem. We have, of course, the formation of ice here on the left, sorry, the formation of ice on uh, airplane wings. Uh, this, of course, um, results in uh, the impossibility to fly uh, for this airplane. And we have now also here on the right, uh, the icing of a wind turbine, which you need to, uh, to treat in order to uh, be able to produce electricity. Now, with respect to modeling, as I said, we, are, um, we have a solid and a liquid phase that are separated by an interface. 
and uh, their interaction between both incompressible faces will result in a moving interface. Uh, so here on some sketch, you can see uh, that we have a liquid face in black, in white, a solid face in gray, and the interface in red that uh, distinguish both, both faces. Uh, the speed of the interface will be related to the jump of conductive heat fluxes, and we will uh, discuss this uh, later. Now, if we talk about interface representation, and this is one of the main uh, topics here, is how to uh, describe the interface. So there are two main uh, methods. The first one is the Lagrangian method, or front tracking. The second one are the Eulerian method, or front capturing. And in those methods, we have, for example, the volume of fluid method, where we have a piecewise linear representation of the interface. This is the method we use for the dynamic contact line problems. But for the heat and mass transfer problems, we use the level set method, which is shown here on this little sketch. Uh, we have an implicitly defined interface uh, by um, implementing a sign distance function, which is called uh, phi. So what happens is that the zero level set of this function will correspond to the interface gamma, and each subsequent level set will, will be equally distant to, that, to the interface. Now, this is very useful because it allows us to uh, directly compute the normal component of a vector uh, to the interface, which is simply uh, the gradient of the level set function divided by its Hamiltonian. Then we have also the very easy computation of the curvature, which is simply the versions of uh, the normal vector. Now, with this being said, we can now recast this two-phase Stefan problem in uh, the level set framework. So we have, as we said, the two heat equations, one on each side. So we are in a two-fluid formulation, uh, where here rho, c, and k are uh, the density, uh, the heat capacity, and the thermal diffusivities, diffusivities for each phase. Then we also have the level set advection equation. This is the equation that will move uh, the interface, with f being a speed function that we will uh, define later. Um, then we have uh, the Dirichlet boundary condition at the interface for the temperature, which is the Gibbs-Thomson relation, which is basically a melting temperature Tm, augmented with a term depending on the velocity, here with the epsilon v, and a term depending on the curvature with epsilon k. And on top of that, we have the Stefan condition for the velocity at the interface, which is basically a balance between the latent heat of solidification, denoted LH, and the uh, conductive heat fluxes. So now we can talk about the numerical methods that we use to solve this problem. So as we said, we have two heat equations and one level set advection equation to move the interface. So if we look at the steps we need to solve this problem, first we uh, solve the heat equations uh, in each phase. Once the temperature field is updated, we can compute the phase change velocity or the Stefan condition. Now the third step, I'm not going to talk about it, but it's basically we need to extend the velocity around the narrow band uh, close to the interface in order to then move to step four, which is the advection of the level set function. Once the level set is advected, we might or might not need to reinitialize it, uh, depending on the perturbation of the interface. And this is in order to retain the sign distance function property. And the last step is the handling of the dead and fresh cells, because we are in a two fluid formulation as the interface crosses the, the underlying Cartesian grid, we might unveil or cover cells, and they require a special, uh, special treatment. So I start first with the solution of the heat equations. Uh, to do so, we are using a specific immersed boundary method, which is called the cut cell method, to solve a Poisson problem, where here we have uh, the Laplacian of uh, the temperature field T, that is equal to a specific source term sigma, and we want to apply a Dirichlet boundary condition at the interface. So this is the this is the goal of this method. And what, what we want to really answer here is what is, what is the minimal amount of uh, geometric information required to discretize this Poisson problem in order to impose this Dirichlet boundary condition at the interface. So we want to do this while retaining some properties for the discrete Laplacian operator, which are to have the classical three-point uh, stencil, and to, of course, recover at least the first order accuracy in mesh aligned cases uh, near the boundary. Now here you can see uh, discrete representation of the interface. So we are in a step which is called the cut cell because the interface cuts uh, this uh, two phase of problem. Uh, we are here on the left in the exact, uh, exact uh, representation of it. We see a curved interface and on the right we have the approximate uh, interface which is just a piecewise linear uh, segment. If we apply the Stokes theorem in a Cartesian coordinate system, we have that the integral over the control volume of the gradient of temperature is equal to uh, the integral over the surface of the temperature, so we can decompose this contour on different, with different terms. Uh, ones that are the weighted faces here in red, the two weighted faces, faces in the x direction, and in blue, the weighted face in the y direction, and of course, the contribution of the boundary, gamma. So uh, 
the geometric conservation law, we can infer the, uh, the, the length of this segment gamma. And uh, this is all described in this paper here by uh, me and myself and the co-authors. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of the discrete operators and the time integration. We're basically uh, embedding this uh, cut cell method with a crank on some uh, uh, type of scheme for the, uh, uh, for the time, time discretization. So now I'm just going to show some validation of, uh, of this scheme. So here uh, we are solving uh, the heat equations, uh, the heat equation on a stationary geometry. We have first a circle embedded in a square domain where we solve the heat equation inside and we impose the Dirichlet boundary condition at the interface, Tg equals to one. So we see that as we increase the number of points per dimension, uh, the error uh, is reduced and we have uh, an order of accuracy that is close to two, um, more than two, uh, four uh, cells away from the, interf uh, from the interface and it's close to 1.5 uh, near the interface. Now, if you look at some uh, ge uh, geometry that is a bit more complex, a crystal, for example, where here, instead of imposing a Dirichlet boundary condition uh, identically equal to one everywhere, we impose it uh, as a function of the curvature. So this is why you see that in the tips, uh, you have a negative temperature and the kinks, you have a positive temperature. So here also we have a, uh, away from the interface, an order of conversion that is close to 1.7 and close to the interface uh, 1.4. So now that we have solved the heat equation, we have the updated temperature field, we can uh, compute the phase change velocity. So as we said, this phase change velocity only depends uh, in the jump of uh, temperature gradient. The method we use to uh, compute this is the johansson colella method. So here on the right, you can see a sketch uh, where uh, we uh, impose uh, the Dirichlet boundary condition here at the interface centroid, TD. We shoot a line in the normal direction and we compute the intersection points with either the vertical or horizontal uh, segments, depending on the orientation. We interpolate these values TA and TB, and then we plug this in uh, this formula to obtain the gradient on one side. If we repeat the same thing on the other side, so for example, here it was on the liquid side, but we do it on the solid side, we can now uh, compute the jump by simply uh, defining the uh, difference of both. Um, now that the velocity is defined, we can uh, advect level set. So the level set advection equation can be written uh, in alternate form, like uh, shown here, with f being uh, the speed function that, will, that is related to the phase change velocity. Uh, this, uh, the, this equation is divided into a conservative and non-conservative term and will result to a, a PDE similar to fusion equation. The, th the thing about this scheme here is that we treat the terms differently if, uh, if they are positive or negative. If uh, f phi is then it represents a forward uh, diffusion and it will be treated implicitly. And if it's uh, positive, it will be treated explicitly. So this is uh, a scheme that was developed by Mikula and co-authors uh, in 2014 that we are using. And one of the uh, great things about this scheme is that it allows us to relax the CFL condition. That is the ratio between the time and uh, the grid size squared because we are not now solving a diffusion equation. Uh, so we initialize, to validate this, we initialize a circle of radius 0.8, two by two domain, and we input a constant velocity field minus one, meaning that the circle will shrink. Uh, we compare this with an analytical solution, uh, and we test this for different grid sizes, ranging from 16 to 64, and different CFL numbers, uh, ranging from one to 16. And what we see here is that no matter the CFL number, the order of convergence is still two. Uh, however, of course, as you increase the CFL, the absolute value of error here, if you go up, this blue line is increased. Now, the last step, as we said, is uh, to treat the fresh and dead cells. What happens when the interface moves, uh, moves over the Cartesian grid is that you might unveil or cover all the other cells. So for dead cells, there's no special treatment because as I said, uh, we are in the two fluid formulation. So basically each is completely agnostic with respect to the other one. Now, for the fresh cells, we need a special treatment because uh, the previously non-existing uh, temperature value needs to be initialized. And this is what we do with the T nu here uh, that is extrapolated off of TB and TA as defined here. And this is a sort of converse johansson colella method. So now that we showed the numerical methods, I'm going to present some validation and simulations of uh, melting processes. So I will start uh, by first uh, describing the package that we use. Uh, it's an in-house code that, uh, was de that is developed in Julia. Uh, Julia is a high-level uh, dynamic programming language. Uh, it solves two-phase problems in, um, in a 2D Cartesian grid. It has, as we said, a sharp interface limit representation for the interface. 
uh, with the level set function. We have the cut cell method to solve the heat equations. Uh, we can also solve convection diffusion equation. We can also now solve incompressible nanistox stokes equations, and we are working on free surface flows. We have phase change cap capacity capabilities with the Stefan condition, and we also have additives, and this will be the following section. Now, the first validation here is the planar, planar interface motion. Uh, we initialize the interface as a plane, and we impose a Dirichlet boundary condition at So the liquid phase is moving up and is melting shell solid layer. Uh, this has an analytical solution for the temperature field, which is basically an error function. Uh, it also, ha also has an analytical solution for the position of the interface, and we can compute uh, the error uh, in temperature field with respect to the analytical solution for different grid sizes. Now, this shows a second order accuracy in L2 and L infinity norm uh, for this case, and this validates as well uh, the uh, implementation of the fresh cells. Now, the second case is uh, the growing uh, Frank sphere. Here, we initialize a circle in an undercooled liquid bath, and uh, it will grow uh, in a symmetric fashion. It also has an analytical solution, which is basically a similarity solution of the heat equation. So uh, if we plot, for example, the uh, radius as a function of time, we can see that it converges towards the analytical solution as we increase the grid refinement. And here on the right, you can see uh, the color map being the uh, normalized error in the temperature field. You can see that the initial sphere is growing and uh, it's tending towards the analytical solution as we increase the number of points. Now, this test case uh, validates the robustness of our method because any uh, small numerical perturbation will lead to uh, numerical instability uh, in those cases. So we are able to retain the symmetric uh, uh, shape of the circle as it grows. Now, if we look at uh, the uh, effect of the surface tension, that is the effect of uh, the surface tension coefficient in the gibbs thompson relation uh, that enters the Dirichlet boundary condition, uh, we, cons we cons can consider now a crystal growth that is an unstable phenomenon, such uh, like the first picture that I showed with the crystal growing, uh, that occurs spontaneously in nature. And uh, there is a competition between the Stefan condition and the gibbs thompson relation. So what happens if uh, we don't take into account the surface tension effect? This kind of thing happens, where we initialize a small crystal at the center here. You can see some uh, numerical noise that, uh, that uh, expand and gives us a non-physical solution. Now, if we introduce uh, surface tension effects with uh, epsilon kappa here uh, times the curvature, we see a regularization of the solution with the symmetry, symmetry uh, of the growth of the crystals. Now, what you ca we can also look at is, that is on the effect of grid refinement for those cases. So we still uh, ha are in the same uh, setup. We are initializing an ice crystal in an undercooled liquid bath. And we test this for different uh, grid sizes, ranging from 50 to 200. So we need the smaller length scale to be resolved in, in order to achieve convergence. And we see that as we increase the number of points, we are converging towards an eightfold uh, crystal shape. Now, another thing that uh, is really uh, important if we want to simulate uh, accurate uh, crystal uh, shapes is the anisotropy effects. So here we introduce a variable surface tension coefficient uh, to uh, simulate that. So for example, if we have uh, the axis of symmetry of the anisotropy that is aligned with the initial shape of the crystal, we have this kind of simulation where uh, we see no rotation of the tips with respect to the initial one. Now if we impose another uh, ax axis of symmetry that is a bit shifted with respect to in the initial one, we, th we see the tips rotating towards, uh, towards the symmetry axis. And this, um, and this is very useful for, um, sorry, for computing the uh, crystal shapes. Now, in the next section, in the next section, uh, I will talk about the uh, continuous agent-based uh, shape optimization that we were able to derive. So now that we have validated the forward problem, that is the direct problem, uh, Stefan problem, uh, we can now uh, try to uh, hold the motion of the interface. So the goals here are to control the interface, as I said, because um, the shape uh, strongly affects the outcome of uh, many industrial and uh, natural processes. And we want to extract efficient control strategies to manipulate the interface motion. So actually what we want to do is we want to minimize a tracking type cross-functional by acting on the control variable W. Uh, subject to the forward problem being the, uh, the two-phase Stefan problem. Here on the right, you can see an example of a convex con cost functional, where in this case, it would be very easy to, uh, to attain the global minimum. We can uh, see it, of course. Then in a practical case, you might have, you might have uh, multiple uh, local minima that might be hard to overcome. 
Now, there are different optimization strategies. Um, the first one are the descent methods, and the other ones are the uh, derivative-free methods. Uh, on the descent methods, we can cite the gradient-based or the Hessian-based ones. Uh, the derivative-free, we have the population methods or the stochastic, um, stochastic ones. Each one has his own uh, pros and cons. On the descent method, we have uh, that the convergence to a global minimum is not guaranteed, whereas for the derivative free, it is guaranteed. But of course, this is uh, at, a, at a much higher computational cost. In the derivative free, met free methods, you might need many function evaluations, uh, resulting in a high computational cost, whereas in the descent methods, the derivatives are, are computing uh, in a single function uh, evaluation. So these are the, the methods uh, we chose to solve this optimization problem. And here I'm just going to recast the forward problem in order to introduce the adjoint derivation. So we chose uh, the differentiate then discretize approach to solve the minimization problem, meaning that we are going to uh, derive the continuous adjoint and discretize it afterwards. So here the different problem that we have been solving so far. Uh, we have still the two heat equations here. We have the initial condition for the temperature. We have now an inhomogeneous boundary condition that acts on the domain boundary with W being the control variable that we want to optimize for. Now, uh, there's also the Gibbs-Thompson relation at the interface, T equals uh, Tm minus uh, the term, depending on the velocity and curvature. We have the level set advection equation, where here I just replaced the speed function by the jumping gradient of temperature and the initial position of the interface here. Now, we want to control this uh, by tracking a prescribed shape and acting on the heat fluxes at the boundary, which is the control variable W. So we introduced this tracking type cost functional where TD and phi D are the, are the um, desired position of the interface and desired temperature field. We have a term that depends on the temperature here. We have then a term that depends on the level set, which is basically the position of the interface. We have an extra term that uh, depends on the interface length. And this is very useful in cases where we want to kill instabilities that, that uh, will, uh, because instabilities will, of course, increase the length of the interface. And then we have the penalization term that will give the optimality condition where we will uh, be able to uh, iteratively update the control variable. Now, the motion problem problem we are solving now is this. We want to minimize this cost, uh, cost functional uh, that depends on the, on the control variable W subject to the forward problem that we just introduced. In order to do so, we introduce the Lagrange functional, which is written here on the left block. So we have the, the tracking type cost functional J minus uh, the integral form uh, of the forward problem uh, times the adjoint uh, variables. So theta here is the adjoint uh, temperature field. Psi is the adjoint level set function. And what we want to do is we want to uh, find the adjoint system uh, by uh, setting the derivatives of this Lagrangian to zero in the direction of t, in the direction of phi, and in the direction of uh, w, which will give us the optimality condition. So we start first by describing a few um, initial steps uh, to, uh, to find this first adjoint temperature field, adjoint temperature problem, sorry. So we want to move uh, the spatial and temporal derivatives towards the adjoint state theta. Now, if you look at, for example, this integral term, we have um, first order derivative with respect to time, second order derivative with respect to space. So we want to integrate by part once with respect to time, twice with respect to space. So when we do it with, pay, uh, in with respect to space, we use the, uh, the Green's formula. Now, when we, in when we integrate by, uh, by parts with respect to time, we're using uh, the Reynolds transport theorem, and in sp uh, particular, it's corollary on integration by parts in time moving domain. Because here, the thing is that the domain of integration is time dependent. So we need an extra term to take into account. Uh, and this is, uh, this is exactly uh, the one that is um, added to the classical integration by part um, formulation, which depends on the velocity of the interface V here. Now, if we look at the adjoint level set, uh, again, we want to move the derivative towards the adjoint state psi. Uh, here, it's a bit more involved because of the geometric nonlinearity introduced by uh, phi on the domains of integration, and it requires shape calculus tools. So here, if we denote d bracket, uh, the variation of a functional uh, in the direction d, uh, d phi, we have this, uh, this problem here that we want, to, uh, we want to solve. So the first two terms will uh, basically cancel, and this, this, the third and fourth one will give us the uh, adjoint level set. In particular, the last one will give us the uh, adjoint level set advection equation. And in this, in this case here, we will need to use the integration by part in, a time, uh, in time on a moving surface, which also have, uh, has extra term with respect to the classical one that depends on the speed here, which is called W uh, in bold, and also the uh, surface divergence of uh, this speed. 
Now, I'm going to skip, of course, uh, the full derivation of this adjoint problem. So I'm just going to first uh, recast here the forward Stefan problem, and now show side by side the adjoint one. So we can see a one-to-one -one correspondence, this correspondence uh, between each equation. We have the first two that are the adjoint heat equations. Uh, we have the third one, which is the um, initial condition for the adjoint temperature field. We have now the boundary condition at the domain boundary, which is mapped from an inhomogeneous Neumann boundary, boundary condition towards an homogeneous boundary condition. Uh, we have the um, Dirichlet boundary condition for the adjoint temperature field that now depends on Psi, Psi being the adjoint level set. Uh, psi now is no longer a sine distance function. This will not be used to track the interface. This will be an extra variable that will enter the problem uh, through this boundary condition here. And the adjoint level set, level set uh, equation is basically a conservation law with the source term here that we can compute by checkpointing these variables being uh, the direct variables. Uh, and of course, the, the last one is the initial condition for uh, the adjoint level set. Now, the last, uh, the last term we need to close the system is the optimality condition. So we want to set the uh, derivative of the Lagrangian uh, with respect to uh, W to zero. Uh, we obtain uh, the gradient equation that is written here, where we will update the uh, control variable W uh, given the value of the adjoint temperature at this boundary at final time. Uh, this minimization problem uh, will be solved using the limited memory DFGS method. And now I'm going to present some optimization cases. So the first one will be the melting circle, the second one will be the Mullins-Sikark instability, and the third one will be the growing crystals. Um, of those cases, the desired level set function and the desired uh, temperature field are computed in advance. I mean, they're known a priori. Uh, and the control variable uh, will be discretely computed on each boundary point uh, using a Fourier basis. This is to ensure the, the smoothness of the uh, boundary condition. Uh, so, of course, we want to optimize uh, the parameters here, A and B, uh, depending on the number of uh, parameters that we want. So, first, the uh, melting circle case. So, we have at iteration zero a circle uh, that is here in, uh, in uh, red, uh, where we and we want to match the final shape here in blue. So, at initial, uh, the first iteration, the control variable is equal to zero. We have no heat fluxes. Nothing is happening. The interface is not moving. And as we iterate through our optimization procedure, we see that the final shape of the interface, which is the red one, starts to match the blue one, and finally we reach uh, the, final, uh, the final iteration here. Now, on the inset at the top, uh, we, we see the uh, value, the uh, boundary condition um, W, that is tending towards the desired one, which is the blue one here. Uh, this convergence in uh, 16, uh, 16 iterations, here you can see on the left, the history of the cost function as a function of the iterations. And we attain a final uh, relative value for the uh, cost functional uh, close to 10 to the minus 3. Now, if you look at the other case, which is the mullins sikerka one, here what happens is that we initialize a uh, perturbed interface, and this will lead to a dendritic growth, such, uh, such like um, the crystal growth that we saw. And what we want to do is we want to hit from boundary such that we are killing this instability. So this is achieved in uh, and here you can see the, uh, the initial uh, condition here in red where we do have instabilities that at the end uh, matches the final one, which is the blue one, that is killed. So notice here, for example, that we are overshooting the solution, right? We are pushing it too far away, and uh, it, later it later comes back. Uh, now, on the last case, this is the most complicated one because we are initializing uh, three crystals here, the three little crystals uh, at the middle, which are uh, disposed in, a, in an asymmetric fashion. And they will grow and merge together. And uh, the, the, um, on top of that, we are adding anisotropy effects uh, in order to push them towards the corner of the, of the domain. Now, what we want to do is we want to apply localized heat, heat fluxes in order to counteract these anisotropic effects. And this is what we can achieve in uh, something like 20 iterations. So we see that the initial uh, growing of the crystal here uh, is going towards the corners of the domain. And as we iterate through time, we can match the final, uh, the final um, interface here in blue. So we are able to basically um, control the final position of the interface, uh, no matter, uh, no matter the, uh, the complexity of the initial uh, system. 
Now, if we summarize these results and we compare it to a derivative-free one, so remember this was all the uh, adjunct-based uh, procedure, um, what, we, what we can see is that we have a fast convergence of the adjunct method. We can converge in something uh, like 20 iterations, for example, for the most complicated case, whereas for the particle swarm method, which is a type of derivative-free method, we, uh, we need 2,000 uh, iterations of this uh, procedure. So, of course, uh, in the derivative-free case, we, we attain a lower value for the uh, relative uh, cost functional. Um, yet, we can say that the LBFGS method still is still close to the global minimum in all of the cases, as we saw that the final interface matched the uh, desired one. Now, in this last section before the conclusion, I'm going to talk about uh, the fluid flow uh, extension of this problem, in particular, the simulation of rayleigh bernard components. Now, so far, we uh, have assumed that um, we could neglect the flow in the fluid phase. So this assumption might, might be too restrictive in some applications, and this is why we need to take into account both the convection and the Navier-Stokes equations in the Boussinesque approximation. Uh, we will consider the evolution of a horizontal layer that is heated from below and bounded by two walls. Here you can see a nice photography of uh, an atmospheric surface layer with the rayleigh bernard convection rules appearing here. So we will uh, test uh, this, uh, this setup and we will compare with previous computations of uh, 5DA uh, and co-authors and Limar and co-authors. So if we look at the governing equations now, we have in the liquid phase uh, the diffusion convection equation where U is the velocity of the fluid. Uh, we have the Navier-Stokes equations in the Boussinesque approximation uh, for the fluid. Then in the solid phase, we have the heat equation. At the interface, we have a melting temperature and we still have the Stefan condition. Now, this is the domain we are considering. We have an initial layer that will be flat and that will melt towards the top and that will create uh, these convection walls that will then modify the shape of the interface. Now, the dimensionless terms that control this flow are the Rayleigh number and the Stefan number. In particular, the uh, Rayleigh number will control the onset of uh, the rayleigh bernard instability. Um, it's useful here to define an effective Rayleigh number that depends on the global Rayleigh number, on the melting temperature, and on the height of the fluid layer. When this effective Rayleigh number uh, reaches a critical value of uh, 1700, the initially diffusion-driven uh, motion will be transformed into a convective one, and we will see the rolls appearing. Now, if you look at uh, the fluid height as a function of time, we see that initially it's a flat interface here at the bottom, and as time progresses, uh, we see that the uh, instabilities appear and that the shape of the interface ends up being this, uh, this one. Now, first we will look at the effect of the global Rayleigh number on this case. So we, we have here two uh, different Rayleigh numbers. We have a Rayleigh number of 10 to the 5 and one 10 to the 4, the other parameters being the same. And what we can see here on the top movie is that at some point the uh, convection rolls appear, and then the interface starts moving up, and then they merge and they stabilize and pushes, uh, push the interface even more. Now, this does not appear here in this, in this case, uh, in the Rayleigh uh, 10 to the 4, up until some point. That means that we have not reached yet the critical uh, Rayleigh number. Now, here, if we wait a few more seconds, we will see that at the end, we reached it and the convection walls will appear. Now, we can also look at the effect um, of, of the global Rayleigh number in a more systematic way. Uh, we have here um, the same setup for different global Rayleigh numbers, and the dashed line here is the critical one of 1700, and we see that for a Rayleigh number of below 10 to the 4, uh, we don't cross this line, so we, uh, we are still in the diffusion-driven motion. Now, if you look at the, uh, the, the height as a function of time, uh, we see a similar thing, where, where basically when we reach the effective Rayleigh number, which is here the black dots, uh, we have a bifurcation of the solution, and this is where the, uh, the instability appears. So, of course, uh, in the case uh, 10, 10, to the, 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 4, we don't see this, and the interface is growing like a square root of time, uh, as in the classical Stefan problem. Uh, now, what we can also look into is the effect of the Stefan number on this. Uh, so, for example, we can have a fixed Rayleigh number and different Stefan numbers, which are related to the speed of the, of the interface. Uh, basically, a high uh, Stefan number will have a low um, latent heat of solidification, meaning that we have a high speed for the interface. So if the Rayleigh number is, is higher, we see that the rolls don't have the time to uh, stabilize and merge, whereas if it's lower, we see that they merge and stabilize late. Now, the other thing we can look into is, um, is the effect of the Rayleigh number in a non-isothermal case, uh, which is a case where the melting temperature now is non-zero. 
meaning that we have uh, we have um, we have a diffusion equation here at the top in the solid phase that will push the interface towards the bottom. What we see here is that for a high Rayleigh number, we reach the critical one. We see the appearing, but the interface is stopped because we are, we have reached equilibrium, and then uh, it stabilizes. Then, for the low uh, Rayleigh number cases, when we, where we don't have the uh, convection-driven motion, we see that the interface goes further and then uh, stabilizes. So, let me now finish this talk by uh, summary and some perspectives. So we have shown here that um, we are able to accurately simulate uh, phase change problems with our novel code cell method uh, for diffusive transport. This was coupled to a level set, um, a level set uh, adduction equation uh, by using a high order uh, scheme. We showed also that we have a robust algorithm to control the shape of melting and solidification processes. So this, this uh, works also in, uh, in presence of uh, dendritic instabilities and uh, anisotropic effects. And we can also uh, now simulate uh, the fluid flow in the, in the fluid phase uh, with this uh, in the Businesk approximation. And this comes favorably with the previous limitations on Rayleigh Bernard instabilities. Now, a few words on the state of flower, which is the, the in-house code that we are using uh, to, uh, to solve all these problems. So this code was uh, developed by myself uh, when I started my PhD, and is now continued by Alejandro Quiroz Rodriguez uh, since 2021. It has also been used for uh, different types of problems. For example, a study on the coining problem uh, by Flav Flavien Soirot uh, during his internship in uh, 2021. Uh, we now have also additions uh, of uh, combustion models, again by Alejandro Quiroz Rodriguez and Ahmed Hassan. So we have this big sketch here where uh, we have a flower that embeds all the uh, different possibilities that we have. We have different models. We have Stefan Problem, Stoke, and now uh, we have uh, different interface tracking methods. We have the level set we are working on uh, height functions. We have in the optimization procedure the adjoint based uh, the adjoint based optimization one. We have the derivative free one and all of this is embedded into an optimization framework. Now the perspective of this work so the first, the first uh, thing that we want to do is we want to apply the same uh, adjunct-based uh, procedure to uh, the case where we uh, have the fluid flow um, uh, simulated. So we want to know if we can derive a meaningful, uh, incomplete adjunct, continuous adjunct in that case, or do we need to uh, revert to the other method, which is to first discretize to obtain a discrete adjunct. Now, the second perspective is to extend all this solver uh, to 3D. And this is an ongoing work with the Julia team of uh, our group, uh, with Alejandro Quiroz Rodriguez, uh, Ricardo Franz, Tom Le Schnedek, and Taran Sayadi. And the last, um, the last perspective is related to the part I didn't talk about during this talk, which is the, the models for contact lines. And what we want to do is we want to uh, take all the models that we did and uh, implement them uh, for phase change problems. And with this final remark, I thank you. J'attends un petit peu.